Uh, I have two questions. Um, one for the uh, both for the for the SM. Um, but before that, what I'd like to say is that I think what we are discussing today is that most of us believe in the integrity of our government. But what we are trying to establish is that are there conflicted, conflicted situations that we should avoid going forward? And then from this, if we agree that there are some conflicted, conflicted situations, whether the outcome of the terms and conditions of the contract reflect that, or whether the terms and conditions reflect a conflicted, conflicted situation. Or not. So we actually are still in the process of uh, discussing and debating, and I hope the SM will be patient that we, we probably cannot conclude whether there is a conflicted situation or not. But first of all, now we are talking about whether there is a conflicted situation or not. So maybe I have two questions I'd like to ask. Is one, um, the SM himself said um, if someone has the power over his personal interest, then it may potentially be a conflicted situation. So if Although the uh, uh, law minister have explained that um, it, it may not be a conflicted situation, although the CEO of SLA reports directly to him, but his personal interest is affected, can be affected by the decision of the CEO of SLA, who reports to the law minister. So indirectly, the law minister, although recusing for himself from the decision-making process, has power over his personal interest. What do you think about this? First question. Second question is regards to the code of conduct. I think the SM, uh, uh, the SM just now mentioned that uh, it should not just be the, the letter of the, the code of conduct, but also the spirit. But we expect our government to be a government of integrity. Don't you think that our expectations and the expectations of many Singaporeans would be you don't touch anything that you are doubtful? So if, can I ask, the SM, if under the current situation, don't you think the two ministers should have considered the possibility of negative public perception? Because the Singaporeans are already saying the ministers are paid million dollars of salaries, the ministers have private bungalows of their own, and they still go and rent a relatively cheaper public bungalow, which, however, are the three most prestigious bungalows in Singapore, and having the government to fork out one over, million over a million dollars to reinstate the bungalows before they move in. Don't you think that that scenario conjures up a very bad picture? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Leong for his emphatic belief in the integrity of our government. Sir, on the issue of uh, conflict of interest, I think we have spent quite a lot of time explaining what needs to be there for a conflict of interest to take place. And, um, and that the uh, Minister Vivian Balakrishnan is not in a conflict of interest situation. And that Minister Shamukam was in a position of potential conflict of interest. And that he took steps to make sure that he removed himself from that potential conflict of interest so that no actual conflict of interest could arise or did arise. And the perceived conflict of interest, I mean, as I explained earlier, if one has dealt with th that there's no actual conflict of interest, there's no potential conflict of interest, then that should be sufficient to dispel the idea of a perceived concept of interest in any fair-minded person. So that's my view. The fact that, yes, he has some power over the appointment of the uh, whether he assesses that the CEO, CEO of SLA performed well or not, that will always be there. All right? that can't, you, you, you can't remove that. But that will mean that the Prime Minister, for example, cannot do anything. 
because he has powers over practically every agency in Singapore, right? So I think one has to look at the realities of the situation and what steps people have taken. And most importantly, to have confidence in the integrity of the public service and our public officers. And I think in this case, our public officers showed a very high degree of integrity. For example, when the management agent asked SLA, is there some BVIP track? The SLA officer replied emphatically to the management agent, no, there is no such thing. Every potential tenant or tenant has to be treated equally. And this is a testament to the quality of the public officers that we have. They know what integrity means and they stand by it. And so I think we have to give credit to our public officers that they know how to behave and they know what to do. So that is a very important aspect of integrity of the public service. On the code of conduct, um, I would first like to dispel another misconception which um, Ms. Mr. Leong's question perhaps inadvertently perpetuates, that these relatively cheap bungalows. It's not true, Mr. Leong. It's not true. And you can see the facts for yourself that it is not true. And I hope that you will help to spread the word that it is not true. The bungalows are rented out at market rates. They're valued. 83% of them are managed by managing agents. About 17% are managed by SLA. And they are all rented out at market rates. The valuations are done by the valuation department in SLA, quite distinct and separate from the leasing department, as we've explained and has been demonstrated. They are also valued by the MAs. And the agents out there have a pretty good idea what they're worth. So I think we should dispel this idea completely, which I think Mr. Leong must have inadvertently uh, sort of contributed to through his question, that these bungalows are going at a relatively cheap rate. Uh, I think also that uh, Mr. Edwin Tong has explained why uh, the expenditure is required to set these properties and to make them habitable and rentable. Uh, I, I'm not a property person myself, but I, I, I do some simple arithmetic. If you have a property which is not tenanted and not in good condition and can't be rented out, you get no rent from it but you have to put money in to cut the grass, to make sure the building at least remains in some decent condition. It doesn't sort of fall down and so on. So it's a complete loss to SLA if it doesn't put the property in a condition which is rentable. So when the prospect of a tenant comes up and the tenant is prepared to offer or looks like he's, he's a credible tenant and looks like he can offer you a decent rent, then SLA says, I will put in the money if the resident is prepared, the tenant, potential tenant is also prepared to put in money. And then we can talk. And the sums look large, $500,000 in round numbers to put SLA, as SLA says, to put the building back into basic habitable condition. But some of, many of the things that they do will last for quite a long time. For example, if a water tank is in very poor condition, you replace the water tank, it will last you 10 years at least. If you have a problem with the roof and the roof is leaking, it will last you when you replace it, or do major repairs on it, it will last you at least 10 years. If you have problems with the beams and the structures because there's a lot of wood in there, and you do work on it, it will last you maybe 10 years. So this is amortized over a period of time. And 
the SLA does its cost-benefit analysis to see whether it is worthwhile. So if a tenant is prepared to pay, let's say, round numbers, $20,000 in rent, $25,000 in rent, $20,000 in rent in the first year will bring back $240,000, $25,000 will bring back $300,000. So within the first two years, the first three years, SLA will collect back somewhere between 600 and 750,000, 750,000, depending, say, I'm getting my numbers mixed up also, say five, six, seven hundred thousand from the rental in the first three years of rental, two to three years of rental. And after that, what they have done is still good for another six, seven years. So if you have a tenant who is prepared to rent it from you for three plus three or three plus two plus two, reliable and prepared to give you good rental, it is a worthwhile thing to do. Because otherwise, SLA will have to put in money every year to maintain the land, to cut the grass, to make sure that no mosquitoes, to make sure that this conserved property doesn't fall down and collapse. And it's a dead loss. Whereas by putting in that investment, they can get a return on investment over a number of years, which will then bring benefits to the state. And these are the kinds of uh, trade-offs, cost-benefit analyses that SLA does, which I think the SLA officers do know and are cognizant that they need to put it do things which are value for money, good cost-benefit analysis, and bring benefit to the state. I think our public officers do have integrity and they do look after the interests of the state and all of us.